here for Albemarle County, Albemarle Charlottesville UVA, as we're fond of saying. Uh, I started as uh, emergency coordinator, what, four and a half years ago? Something like that. And then John took over, very kindly took over for a year and a half while I focused on the CubeSat and some uh, mesh stuff. And then, uh, and then I took it back when John agreed to be club president. And, uh, and this space is for rent. Anybody who wants to be emergency coordinator, come talk to me. <laughs> so, uh, so what I want to do tonight is, uh, oh, probably offend some of you, uh, but I'm going to do it anyway. I, my intention is to, to challenge you to think outside the, the box a little bit. What I have uh, discovered uh, in my time as emergency coordinator is uh, that the Aries that I knew about when I first got licensed when I was in high school, so 40 years ago, plus or minus, uh, 35, 40 years ago, it's still here. It hasn't changed. And yet the rest of the world has changed. And I'm going to talk a bit about the way the world has changed and how I think Aries needs to evolve in order to keep up with what's going on in the rest of the world. So. So the world changed. Everything in the world changed that day. And certainly the way we think about emergency response and emergency communications changed that day. Um, and I'm going to talk about three ways in which I think it's changed. Uh, first way, so public safety communications infrastructure. You know, it's not that anymore. And it's not that. Um, 121 firefighters died when the towers collapsed. They died because of communications failure. Their communication systems were overwhelmed. They weren't working properly. The people who knew the towers were coming down tried to send out a warning. Their systems didn't interoperate with the fire department systems. Plus, you had fire departments, police departments, rescue squads coming from all over the New York City area, every one of them had their own radio system. None of them worked together. <coughs> so there's been a massive rethinking about public safety communications infrastructure since 9-11. Uh, you see it in Virginia, in large part, in upgrades to all of our public safety communication systems. So, so most of the jurisdictions in Virginia have had their systems upgraded since 9-11. Most of them to trunk radio systems, which are, it's a fancy way of saying repeaters, better repeaters. Um, but they're still repeaters. And, uh, and they're mostly interconnected now. So, uh, and the radios that the individual responders use are mostly interoperable now. Not 100%, but uh, pretty close to 100%. And the Commonwealth of Virginia has these things that they call communications caches. They are. Uh, Scattered around the state, you see a little bit of a map. They're trucks with towers on them, trunk radio repeaters. They're also portable units that are not mounted on towers. They can bring these in uh, on very short notice and set up a new trunk radio system to either replace the one that uh, you have that has failed or to supplement the one uh, supplement when you've got something big going on. And in fact, we use this for the Unite the Right anniversary in August. <clears throat> uh, I think two trunk radio, uh, portable trunk radio units were brought in, set up on rooftops in downtown Charlottesville, and established a separate 800 megahertz, 800 megahertz trunk radio umbrella for downtown Charlottesville for the event. Um, AT&T. You've heard of FirstNet. FirstNet, so I tried really hard to find out how much money has been spent upgrading public safety communication systems in the last 20 years, and I couldn't find numbers anywhere. You'd think Homeland Security would be crowing about this, but for some reason, that number's hard to come by. But FirstNet alone, this is a nationwide public safety cellular base, so uh, LTE 5G, the so-called so 5G network. Uh, nationwide dedicated for public safety communications, dedicated to first responders, um, is going to cost $40 billion to build out. 
that's just one investment. So we're talking hundreds of billions, possibly a trillion dollars in public safety communications investments. The, the takeaway from this, from our standpoint, for me, is if our slogan is when all else fails, we might as well go to sleep because our phone's never going to ring. The, even if the primary system fails, a new one's here on a truck in four hours. So the chances of the primary systems going down are small and getting smaller every day. You also may have heard, I don't know, last summer <clears throat> when uh, Maria uh, destroyed most of Puerto Rico and took out all of the communications on the island, um, AT&T brought in a couple of these suckers. It's, it's a drone. It's not the drone that you might have uh, to fly around your living room. I think it costs a half million dollars. Um, it's a cell tower on uh, a, a remotely controlled helicopter. They put a couple of these in the air over Puerto Rico and restored a lot of cell service uh, to Puerto Rico, prioritized for first responders uh, within hours of the hurricane going through. So uh, unlike, uh, what was that cartoon, or what was the TV show? Uh, Car 54. Uh, was that Car 54? It was uh, Adam 12. 12. It was Adam 12. Uh, I had a Car 54 picture too, but it, it was even sillier. Uh, so unlike the Adam 12 car, cars these days are much more likely to look like this and fire trucks and rescue squad vehicles. They've got multiple radios, both voice and data. They've got computers in them. Uh, they're, they're little data centers on wheels. And the first responders get used to using this stuff. <clears throat> Another thing that's changed is the expectations of emergency workers. Um, in, the, in the late 60s, early 70s, in the western states, mostly California and Arizona, this notion of the incident command system was created. It grew out of wildfire fighting. There was a, a, a huge uh, rash of forest fires in the West in the late 60s, and a massive effort in the West to suppress forest fires starting in the late 60s and going into the early 70s. And they realized they needed some structure. And of course, this in part was, again, in response to some uh, firefighters who died. They needed more structure to improve communications and organized response to, to these events. And they created what we now call the incident command system. After 9-11, there was a presidential homeland security directive that established the incident command system as the law of the land for emergency response in the United States and created what's called the National Incident Management System, which takes ICS and sort of blows it up and, and makes it a, a more general uh, way of thinking about incident management. And, uh, and now, any agency that takes federal funds is required to operate under ICS and NIMS, which means every agency is required to operate under ICS and NIMS, which means everybody we work with is operating under ICS and NIMS every day. <clears throat> and we won't talk about ICS and NIMS much more. Another thing that's important about ICS and NIMS is that it's not just for disasters. It's also for planned events. In fact, University of Virginia uses ICS to manage football games. Every football Saturday, they use it to run the, foot, the, the uh, response to the football game. Um, <clears throat> the mission has changed. Uh, you know, we didn't talk, uh, your average first responder probably didn't talk about terrorism very much before 9 11. Uh, we talk about it a lot now. Uh, and uh, now the, the, the buzz phrase is um, all hazard multi-agency planning and response. Every jurisdiction looks at the things that are most likely to happen in their jurisdiction. You make emergency operations plans that address those things that are likely to happen in your jurisdiction. You update them. You train for them together, not individual agencies training on their own but everybody training together, working together before the incident happens, before the disaster hits. And, uh, and you've got plans in place that you can roll out very quickly for most of the scenarios that you're likely to face, uh, including terror kinds of scenarios. 
So, you know, when all else fails, has served amateur radio on Aries very well for the first, ref first reference I could find to the slogan, when all else fails, was, was in QST in, sometime in the 70s. So at the very least for 40 years, this slogan has served us really, really well. I, I think we're looking at a choice. Uh, whether we stick with all, when all else fails, uh, understanding that most Aries units probably will never deploy. Uh, because their services just won't be needed? Or do we climb on board, become a part of the team, not give up all of the stuff that we know how to do? You know, the world may be happy someday that there are hands because everything may fail. Everything failed in Puerto Rico. Um, and so it can happen, but it's not as likely to happen as it, as it once was. And for me, this is the answer. We, we get on board. We become a part of the team. We do the things that we can do before everything else before everything else fails. And I'm going to talk about a lot of the things that I think we can do, and a lot of the ways in which uh, our local emergency planners believe we can be valuable for emergency response here in in Albemarle. <clears throat> so, uh, in the run up to the Unite the Right rally, and uh, by the way, thank you to the folks who responded. This was sort of an experiment uh, to see how, how this theory would work. Uh, so uh, Dave responded, and Rick responded, and I did, and John, and Michael Ryan, and Dayton Haw. Did a great job. No amateur radio anywhere in sight. We didn't use our radios. We didn't use our licenses. Uh, we got trained up on the 800 megahertz system. And we were radio operators. We were at the command post. We were at the EOC. We were at the logistics base. Uh, we were providing radio communications to the leadership of the incident command structure that was established for the event. And it was a big hit. We didn't spend much time on the radio because the telephones kept working. And, uh, and if you've got phones, you don't need radios, by and large. But, uh, but we were there. <clears throat> and as Gabe Elias, the gentleman who runs the public safety communications and IT infrastructure for the county and city, said what he, what he needed was people who aren't afraid of radios. That looks like us. And people who can solve communications problems under pressure. And I said, I think that's ham radio. And, and I can tell you that after that and a couple of other uh, ways in which we've helped out, the, the county and city emergency management folks agree. They think that we can be a part of the team uh, even before everything else falls apart. So here in Albemarle, we're part of ESF2. Uh, if and when you do your, your ICS training, you'll find out that ESF stands for Emergency Support Function. Uh, emergency Support Function 2 is communications. And, uh, and as has been pointed out to me, and, and I, uh, so I always point it out now, if you look in the ESFs for ham radio, you'll find ham radio under ESF 6, which is sheltering and mass care. And uh, so officially, ham radio is thought of as people at shelters passing health and welfare traffic for, for folks who are in the shelters. That's not the way we think about ham radio here in Albemarle County. Here in Albemarle, we're part of the communications team uh, in, Al in, in the county. Uh, the things that our emergency management folks value from us, besides not being afraid of radios, is <clears throat> Digital data communications. So there's an upgrade to the public safety communication system coming. Uh, even when it's finished, it's not going to have extensive digital communications capabilities. It'll have more than it has now, probably. Uh, but it's not going to be heavy on data communications. So the mesh network kind of stuff, being able to move video from incident sites back to the command post, back to the EOC, uh, those sorts of things are uh, of great interest to our emergency management folks. Uh, HF communications over short range, NVIS, or near ver vertical incident skywave, the ability to communicate into some of these hollows around the county where none of our VHF and UHF systems work very well. But 
we can bounce off the clouds and come right back down into a valley and establish both voice and digital communications in and out of some of these difficult to reach, reach places. And mobility. Uh, you know, we don't know where the incidents are going to be. Uh, so our ability to operate off the grid, to respond and have a station up and running on short notice is of great interest to the folks in the city and the county. So, <clears throat> why should you participate in this new world? Um, you know, I'm telling you, uh, when we get to the end, you're going to find out that I'm going to ask a lot of you if you want to be a part of Aries in this county. Why should you care? So the establishing legislation uh, said in part that amateur radio exists, and this is the first thing on the list for why have amateur radio, because of emergency communications to provide a backstop of emergency communications and people who understand how to communicate in emergencies for the nation. Um, I do it in large part because I get to do public service. I, I get to give back to the community. It feels good to me to be able to use what I've learned and the skills that I have and my resources to be able to make our community a better, safer place to live. And just selfishly, there's a lot of cool stuff that we can do. Uh, a lot of interesting technology, a lot of neat new communications techniques that, uh, that I'm excited about. I'm going to talk about some of them, and I hope you'll be excited about them too. So <clears throat> things that uh, we have started doing, but I'll tell you, all of these things are in their infancy. And there's a lot of work to be done, lots of opportunity, and I need help. Uh, and so I'm hoping people are going to get excited about this. Winlink. We've talked. I've talked about Winlink before. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Winlink. We have two Winlink gateways uh, up and running. Uh, well, three really. Two that I run, and and one that Jack KU4LWT runs up in uh, Greene County. Um, Winlink is email over the radio, and uh, instead of all of the bleeps and bloops, the the noises you're telephone modem used to make putting the audio tones over the phone, those audio tones are going over amateur radio. But what you see is an email client that looks pretty much like any other email client, and you can send all the stuff that you can send an email. Uh, so this is a very valuable tool for sending, uh, for sending information that needs to arrive at the other end accurately. Uh, it is error-free end-to-end, uh, so if it's received on the other end, it's, it's accurate and complete on the other end. Um, and retries are automatic, uh, so it's very convenient for sending lists of stuff, uh, detailed messages. Um, we've got two mesh network nodes. You've no doubt seen talk about amateur radio mesh networks in the various publications, and I've spoken about it here before. Uh, we have two nodes up and running. Again, uh, we're, we're thinking the next phase, uh, so these two nodes give us pretty decent coverage of the Charlottesville area. One's just right up the hill here at W4UVA and the other one's over at Martha Jefferson. And, uh, and so we've got enough to start experimenting. What we need is some people to build some mobile stations uh, to get on the air and start experimenting with these things. There's a group up in the Manassas area that uh, has done a couple of times uh, what they call mesh in the park. They get together in a local sizable park, a park sort of the size of uh, McIntyre. And they set up half a dozen or eight mesh nodes around the park, and they experiment with communicating with each other. I think that would be a great thing for us to try out here uh, if, if some of us, if more than me, has mesh nodes. So I'd be delighted to have something like that happen. Uh, and this. Again, the, we've got a lot of dead spots that we can get into with amateur radio. Uh, we just need to build some antennas. It's really not very difficult. Some PVC pipe and some wire. You can buy all the parts of, of an Envis set up at Lowe's. Um, <clears throat> I think most of you were here when the two guys who deployed to Puerto Rico uh, with FEMA gave their presentation. And, and one of the things that they did was put together an Envis antenna building class uh, for the Puerto Rico National Guard. Because they had the equipment, but they didn't have antennas, and they didn't know how to use it. So they taught them how to do Envis. Each team had to build an antenna and put it on the air. And they got all the supplies at Lowe's and Home Depot. So it's not difficult. Drones. So I can't afford a half million dollar drone. Can you? But hey, we're hams. 
we can do this stuff on the cheap. Uh, there are hobby grade fixed wing drones, twin engine fixed wing drones, this one right here, for example. People are, those are electrically powered, radio controlled, that's about a, you, there's no scale there, it's about a two meter wingspan, so wingspan a little bit bigger than that. And uh, people are flying those for two or three hours uh, without coming back for new batteries. So uh, two of those we could have, uh, and they can easily carry enough payload to do a mesh radio, uh, possibly an APR, APRS digipeter, um, no telling what, but you can put a fair bit of useful stuff in that and park it over an incident site uh, indefinitely if you've got a couple of them and can cycle them back to get fresh batteries. Uh, John and I, John helped me uh, by, by sacrificing one of his quadcopters to the cause. Uh, this, is, <clears throat> this is a uh, mesh node stripped down to fly under John's quadcopter and the whole thing is about Yay big. And, um, and it worked. We got it up to, what, we went up to about 150 feet, John, something yeah, like 50 that? 50 meters. 50 meters. And, um, and it turns out we weren't quite clear of the trees, so we never linked up with, I, I thought we were going to link up with the mesh node at Martha Jeff, but we didn't quite get quite above the tree line. <clears throat> and five gigahertz is all strictly line of sight. Uh, but had no trouble whatsoever communicating with, with it from the ground. I had a really solid signal from the, from the ground, and, and so clearly this will work. If we can get it up above the tree line, get line of sight back to one of the fixed locations, then we can drop mesh network pretty much anywhere we want. And this stuff is, these things are three, four hundred bucks. So it's the sort of thing that, it's the scale of expense that we make on radio equipment pretty regularly. And let, lest anybody wonder, the, the issue with the drone was not that the radio destroyed it. Yes. It was that it lost a rotor when it was about 100 feet up, about 30% of the way back, immediately inverted and power drived into the ground. But yes. a, uh, a new case for the drone and a, and a few hours of futzing with a uh, surface mount uh, USB connector and all was well again. He put it back together. I tried to convince him to throw it in the trash on the way out of the field, and he took it home and put it back together. I'm, I am so impressed. So clearly, we did proof of concept. Clearly, this can work. We have to figure out how to package it. What other sorts of things do we want to fly? One of the other things that we might want to fly, uh, how many people have heard of the Internet of Things? You've heard buzzwords, Internet of Things? The, the, the short version of Internet of Things is uh, anything Imagine anything in the world that runs on electric power, whether it be plugged into the wall or a battery, uh, all of those things on the internet. Now, you can say, that's a stupid idea, and you might be right. I'm not saying it's a great idea, but what it is doing is driving a huge amount of innovation in the radio space. There is a lot of R&D work being done on very, very small uh, radios, they're data radios, almost exclusively data radios. Modest data rates, 50, 60 kilobits per second, but you can do a lot with 50 or 60 kilobits per second. Uh, they're virtually all designed to run on batteries for extended periods of time without being visited. Uh, these things are gonna be uh, connected to a sensor out there someplace and you don't want to have to go change the batteries all the time. So these things are being designed to run for a year, two years on batteries or on a very small solar array or some of them even by uh, scavenging, scavenging radio, radio energy and, and repurposing it to run its own device. Uh, <clears throat> this is an amateur radio but it's cool and my feeling is it doesn't have to be ham radio in order to be fun to play with. So there's just a huge set of options for communications here. You can, if you can do 50 kilobits per second over distances of a couple of kilometers, I can think of a lot of public service sorts of stuff that we can do with that. If we could put uh, an Internet of Things repeater over a race course, 
I can think of lots of things that we could do with data collection, tracking writers, keeping track of what's going on at rest stops. Uh, a lot of the stuff that we do with APRS right now but doesn't scale well with APRS because it's too expensive would scale really well with this sort of technology. So I think there's a, a world of stuff that's really fun to play with and um, and and it's not all going to be interesting to any one person, but I think there are a lot of people in this room who could find one of the things on that list to be interested in. So for me, the future of Aries is not just about rolling to a shelter and relaying health and welfare traffic it, in, in a hurricane. It's about all of the stuff that we need to do to get ready to provide useful communications, communications that are not just voice but also data. Uh, and to be ready to do that in a, in a way that is, it's, it's not going to be as robust and as resilient as the public safety systems that cost hundreds of millions of dollars. But I think, as with most stuff, we can do really, really well with a lot less money and have a really meaningful backup to the, the systems that these folks use every day. And plus, as I said before, I don't plan on being emergency coordinator for life. So uh, we need to, there, there's space for people who are interested in organizing and planning and leadership as well and, and not so uh, excited as I am by the technology. So what do you, if you're interested, what do you do? So first thing, I'm going to hit reset on Aries here. Uh, there are no more Aries members in Albemarle County. Everybody's fired, including me. If you want to be an Aries member, send me a note or track me down. Let me know you're interested. We'll have a conversation. And once you've met the membership requirements, what I'm going to talk, which I'm going to talk about in just a second here, uh, then I'll put you on the active roster and you'll be eligible to, for deployment. But more importantly, we'll figure out what you're interested in and what you can contribute and, and how you fit into the overall area structure in the, in the county. And again, it doesn't have to be people who deploy to the field. There are, there are folks in the club who, for lots of different reasons, aren't able to deploy in times of crisis. They might, might have family responsibilities. They might have physical issues. They might, you know, it doesn't matter. There are lots of reasons why, depending on what phase of your life you're in, you might or might not be able to drop what you're doing and hop on a plane to Puerto Rico and stay there for two months. I, I understand. Not everybody can do that sort of stuff. But there's a lot of stuff that you can do to support the people who can deploy in an emergency. And so there's, there's room for all sorts of people in, in Aries, I think. When you look at the requirements, the new requirements for Aries membership for Albemarle, you're going to say, hey, that's tough. And my answer is, you're right, it's tough. Because amateur radio is a hobby. Emergency communications is not a hobby. The people, the first responders that we work alongside, this is deadly serious business for them and it had better be serious for us. And if you're not serious about it, find something else to do. But there's no room for, pe for people who think of Aries as a hobby. So there are going to be training requirements. At the very least, and this is pending some other stuff that's going on, some of you may have seen um, this. Uh, the league has had for a couple of years this thing called the Public Service Enhancement Working Group that has been thinking about the future of Aries. They have produced a draft report that's out for comments. You can find it on the league website. It's been mentioned in QST and postings on the website a couple of times. And I think uh, I think the Roanoke Division, uh, I think they sent out a an email pointing it out and asking, pointing out that there's a comment period. The comment period is open until. Well, until at least the end of October. But it's worth looking at it and comment, commenting. It's only 10 or 12 pages long. Uh, it goes, it in part, is talking about the same stuff that I've talked about tonight, uh, the need to, to be more professional, the need to be more flexible in what, in what we're willing to do and, and when, we're, when we're willing to respond. Uh, they also talk about training requirements. 
uh, what they're talking about in the draft, uh, and I'm going to push back on them a little bit because I think they've gone a bit too far uh, in their draft training requirements. They're talking about ICS 100, 200, 700, 800, which are all online, plus the, uh, uh, the thing that the league uh, has offered for years, but temporarily they're looking for a new provider. It's a, a, a mentored online training course. It's called EC1, Emergency Communications 1. Uh, and they want all ARIES members to do that. Plus, they want emergency coordinators, anybody in a lead leadership position, to do ICS 300 and 400, which are both classroom uh, training sessions. That, that, I think, is reasonable. I think um, uh, doing all four of the uh, online uh, IS courses and the EC1 is probably a little bit of overkill on ICS for your average ARIES member. It's, it's very repetitive. I, once you've done 100 and 700, I think you get it. And um, 200 and 800 are just sort of being beaten over the head with the same stick. Um, but in leadership positions, you definitely need to go, uh, uh, you need to go further. Um, we're going to have to do background checks. Uh, as the, the two guys who deployed with FEMA mentioned the uh, the Ares folks who deployed to uh, Puerto Rico were unable to set up and operate inside the shelters because they hadn't been through background checks and the Red Cross wouldn't let them in uh, and that's going to be the case here uh, we we were allowed into the command post and the EOC and the logistics space for the Unite the Right anniversary because uh, Allison knows me really well and she knows Dave and I vouched for everybody personally and and it was okay but but that's not a that's not something we can do every every event and every incident going forward. So I'm talking with the, with Allison and her folks about what we do about background checks, and there and something is going to have to happen about background checks. Uh, we're going to exercise, and there'll be a requirement to participate in exercises. Uh, I'm thinking uh, that maybe we'll do four exercises, something like that, a year. Plus the county organizes exercises. Uh, and, uh, and other uh, agencies do exercises. So we're going to have opportunities to, to buddy up with other agencies and do some training exercises. And, uh, and I'm going to expect uh, full ARIES members to participate in at least 70% of those. Uh, you also need to participate in public service events, at least four public service events. I hope you'll participate in club events, but if you want to go work the Marine Marathon and, and bring me a letter that says I worked the Marine Marathon, that's cool too. Um, doesn't matter. But public service is also good training. Uh, I've been talking with Dave, and we're going to work over the winter <clears throat> to, uh, to start incorporating ICS comp, uh, concepts, ICS structure, um, incident action plans, some of the things that you see in, a, in an ICS run incident to start incorporating those into club public service events. So you'll start seeing some of that stuff, whether you're an ARIES member or not. Um, Voice communications. Everybody's going to need to have a voice capability, and uh, an HT doesn't cut it. Uh, for lots of the places we deploy, uh, an HT just doesn't, it's not strong enough, the antenna's not good enough. You need to have uh, what most of us would consider to be a mobile unit, uh, something that has decent transmit power, uh, an antenna that has some gain, uh, and you need to be prepared to operate both from your vehicle, if it's mounted in your vehicle like mine is, or from inside a building, which means crossband repeating, uh, 100 foot of coax in the trunk, and, and the ability to, to pull your uh, radio out of the car and put it in the building and run a coax out to the antenna on the car. There are lots of ways to do it, but, um, but everybody needs to have a, a pretty serious voice, VHF, UHF voice communications capability. Um, and then uh, some of the more advanced technologies, uh, you don't have to do all of these, but I'm going to ask everybody to do at least one of them. Um, have a mobile wing, wind link set up, preferably with HF capability as well. Uh, build yourself an, an NVIS antenna and have a go kit with an HF radio in it in your antenna and be able to, de to deploy and do NVIS from someplace where we need you. Um, build a mesh network node. Uh, it's not terribly expensive. It's not complicated. Happy to work with you on that. Or participate in designing and operating some of the infrastructure that supports this stuff. I need help with, with mesh backbone nodes. I need help with wind link gateways. I need help with IT infrastructure. There, there are jobs uh, that people can get involved in. 
we're going to start doing a monthly meeting. Um, we can negotiate, negotiate about date and times, but for starters, uh, we're going to do fourth Tuesday of the month. Club meeting, second Tuesday. Aries is going to be fourth Tuesday. Probably the first one uh, here at the end of October will be at the Northside Library. It looks like they have a room. I'm going to book it tomorrow. Uh, so we'll meet at the Northside Library. We'll do some training, and we'll talk about uh, the various projects we have underway and who's working on, on what projects. I mentioned we're going to do some exercises, <clears throat> public service activities, and um, everybody can just get involved in shared infrastructure and your own personal infrastructure. And <clears throat> personal infrastructure includes uh, your family and, uh, and your home and the things that you're responsible for. Uh, all first responders know that if, if your family isn't safe, you can't be effective. And, uh, and so every, all of us need to think about what happens at home if we're off on the radio someplace at the EOC or whatever. We need to be confident that our property is secure, that our families are safe. And that takes some planning. So that's what I have to say. Uh, I think there's an exciting future for Aries, personally. I think there's a lot of opportunity. I know the county and city folks want us to be involved. Uh, we have an enviable relationship with our emergency management folks uh, that uh, Dave handed to me. And I think John and I have, have uh, done our best to preserve that relationship. Uh, our emergency man management folks really like ham radio. And I think we can keep it that way and we can be a part of the team in a really, really meaningful way in the future. So thanks. Questions? Uh, questions, lightning rods, uh, what? Who does the background check? Don't know. Uh, you know, you can go online and, and whip out your credit card and, and, and get what it, they call a background check for 35 bucks, but that's not what we're talking about. Um, I think we're talking about working with uh, the sheriff's department or the fire department and piggybacking on the background checks that they do for their for their folks, probably. Something like that. So probably no worse than the, than the background check you'd go through if, say, for example, you were a teacher in the public school system. You know, they all have to go through a background check. It's a check, for your crim check of your criminal record. Are you a registered sex offender? Are you this, that? You know, it's, it's that kind of background check. It's not the FBI interview, er, interviewing everyone you've ever met in your life to find out if you're a communist. It's not that kind of background check. It's the, the routine sort of employment criminal background check is what we're talking about. But we want to do something that's recognized. So if we, if we deploy on a mutual aid agreement uh, and we walk in and we say, hey, we've been through a background check, it's one that, that the folks that we're working with there will actually recognize and, uh, and will be able to function. Yeah? Your entire UAV setup, like controls and uh, basically everything you need to get something off the ground, how yeah. much does that cost? Uh, well, understand that this is all in my head right now, so I'm just I'm just guessing, but um, uh, one of those uh, fixed-wing twin-engine uh, drones, it, the all of the parts to put one together is on the order of four hundred dollars. Uh, you'd need extra batteries. You need, um, uh, you know. Five or six hundred, uh, but that's just a guess. It's under a thousand, I think, for sure. Yeah, and the quadcopter um, was three hundred. And there, there are lots of ham radios that cost five or six hundred bucks. So, it's it's the same scale of money as a as a new radio for your car. But basically, if someone gets involved, you would, you could give specific recommendations on what type of dual band radio. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to. You don't have to figure out all of this stuff for yourself. Like I say, if you're interested in being part of Aries, um, I'm going to schedule a time to sit down with you, and and we'll have a cup of coffee, and we'll talk about what your skills are, what are you interested in, uh, what kind of time do you have to put into it, what's your situation as regards deployment and, and your family, are you able to deploy on short notice or not? Um, you know, I want to find out. I, I, I want to talk with everybody about who's interested about what the fit is for you 
and figure out what you can bring to, to Aries to make Aries better and more effective. And, uh, and yeah, we'll talk about hardware too. And for a lot of this stuff, we're just, we, we have to figure it out. Uh, I, I've, got a, I've got a concept about UAVs. I have a concept about MESH, about a uh, concept about IoT, but it's all just ideas. And, uh, and we need people to actually roll up their sleeves and figure out how to make some of it work. Yeah, Dave. Um, how, how well does this appear to interface <coughs> You, you, under, you understand the camera's rolling, right? Could you turn that off for a second? Do you want it off? I can turn it off. Yeah. No, you can leave it on. Okay. I can't uh, edit. No, I, so uh, I think that um, my, my sense is that uh, from what I read about other Ares units is that uh, certainly Winlink has got some traction. Uh, mesh has some traction. There, there are Ares units that are actively using mesh. The, it, it was used during wildfire season out west last summer. The Marine Corps Marathon, uh, they're, they're setting up like 20 mesh nodes along the, the marathon course uh, in a, two weeks, something like that, and are going to use the mesh heavily. The Boston Marathon folks use mesh uh, mostly to push video feeds around the course. Um, so that for some of the technologies, other uh, Ares units are adopting those. Um, my sense is that uh, that most Ares units are um, they're trying to maintain good relationships with their served agencies, but uh, there are a couple of big differences. Uh, most of the other Ares units I've talked with have multiple relationships with multiple served agencies. So the, the Ares unit will have an MOU with the Red Cross, and they'll have an MOU with the fire department, and one with the police department, and they might have a half a dozen MOUs. We decided a while back here in Albemarle that we have one served agency, the Office of Emergency Management for the county and city and, and university. And, and so, uh, for example, in the Unite, Unite the or not the Unite the Right, in the, the hurricane. We were on alert for the hurricane. And I got a call from the Red Cross saying that, wondering if, uh, if we could provide radio operators for shelters that the Red Cross were opening and it was opening. And I said, you have to, you have to call the emergency management office. I, I don't want to be the one to decide where our resources go. That should be a decision taken at a, at a, more, at a higher, more coordinated level. Um, so I think most Aries units are, are uh, still pretty traditional. They might have picked up a couple of new technologies, but I think my sense is that what we're talking about here is, is pretty aggressive, uh, a different way of thinking about Aries. Uh, I think for most Aries units, the notion of doing what we did with the Unite the Right rally, where we, I, I forget, I added it up, I forget how many person days we put in, but it was, uh, you know, 25 or 30. and. Um, and no ham radio anywhere in sight. And, and I don't think most Aries units are thinking about it that way. Uh, as far as the state goes, uh, to me, the state organization is irrelevant. They, they don't do anything for us. They don't even respond most of the time. I mean, I've, I've, sent, I've sent our uh, section emergency coordinator half a dozen emails in the last two months, and I haven't gotten a single response. So, and I think it remains to be seen whether the national organization is, is relevant. I think the, the draft that they put out goes part of the way. I think it's right about integrating with, uh, with ICS and NIMS. Uh, it, it comes down strongly in favor of that. Uh, and it's right about the training. Uh, the, document, the document is like 10 pages long. And a page and a half of it is about NTS and how important NTS is to emergency response, which I just think is wrong. Especially with Facebook. Yeah. And it, uh, well, as with Winlink, you know? Winlink can do everything NTS can do. 
uh, digital modes can operate in, in just as crummy conditions as CW. And it doesn't take 24 hours to get a message from one side of the country to the other. Yeah. It takes a minute. Worst case, if it's HF all the way, if, if a couple of gateways have to do HF relays to get from one coast to the other, it might take a half an hour. But uh, you know, by the time you, get, you end up waiting for NTS cycles, it can take a day for something to get across the country. And uh, every, every field day, uh, except one when I was out of, out of the country two summers ago, I've injected anywhere from 10 to 20 messages into the NTS. And as far as I can tell, half of them never get delivered. So, uh, you know, this 10-page this document spends a page and a half on NTS, which I think is wrong. Uh, I think it's not useful. But for the most part, I think it's fairly right-minded. So the national organization might actually be headed in the right direction. That's just me. Read it and form your own opinion. Uh, just a couple of thoughts. You said when you went through that uh, exercise, you were all using your cell phones? Uh, for the Unite the Right? Uh, no, uh, mostly wired phones. Uh, each, uh, each of the operating positions had a multi-line telephone that was set up uh, for the event, and, and most of the work was done either on those wired telephones or a lot of the, a lot of the ICS uh, leadership positions use their own personal cell phones because that's what they do every day. A lot of people fell back on what, what they do from a day-to-day -day 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 well, basis. You know, we, but we all had, uh, you know, Motorola XTS you know, 5000 you know, radio. Uh, you know, South Carolina, you know, I'm sure 90% of the cell phone systems were completely down. And right. Were totally flooded. Right. So you shouldn't practice that way. Right. Well, no. You shouldn't practice with telephones. Uh, that was a real event yeah. with, with pretty high stakes. Sure. And, uh, and we weren't going to pretend the phones didn't work just for the fun of it. Yeah, but we were going to communicate the most effective way, effective way possible. During exercises, you bet, the phones fail. And yeah. You, and you have to think about things like uh, uh, nuclear EMP that's going to take out everything. Yep. It's gone. Yeah. It's plugged in, it's gone. So, so I'm not saying the when all else fails scenario isn't still out there, but it's not very likely. That's what I'm saying, is if we don't want to put all of our eggs in that basket. Uh, because there's a whole lot of good we can do while we're waiting for global thermonuclear nuclear war, right? There are a lot of good things we can do before that. So, and yes, we shouldn't we shouldn't exercise and rely entirely on telephones for exercise communications because we need to know how to do it other ways too. Well, I was just thinking about you know things in my previous lifetime. Um, all the Russian radios were twos. And they handled the end. Um, had a uh, uh, piece of equipment that required uh, a memory unit. Uh huh. And it had a bubble memory. Yeah. Rock solid. You know? Yep. And they could get a whole division out of the barracks in absolute radio silence with mm -hmm. flags. Yeah, we should have a semaphore division. <laughs> I, I learned semaphore in Boy Scouts, and I can't remember a single thing except I think that's stop, right? <laughs> that's it. Uh, you can head up the semaphore division, Dennis. Yeah, How about that? Will, yeah. And, and the uh, lighting light. And the, the, yes, the Aldous lamp. Yes. I think right on. No, we need to, we need to retain these uh, traditional capabilities. I'm not saying we throw them away. Absolutely not. I think the entrance is a really good idea. Yeah. It's real low-hanging fruit. It's, it's cheap, it's simple, and it solves a real problem. And if we had that capability, that would, that would uh, make emergency response in the county I mean, significantly more effective. Right. Yeah, it's, it's so simple to do. You, you, build, you build a dipole, and, and, and you put it up 12 feet off the ground, and that's all there is to it. Uh, it's, it's a couple of pieces of wire. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, my, uh, 
my fan dipole in the attic has some significant NVIS uh, component, yeah, for sure. So, well, thank you. I really appreciate it. I hope, uh, I hope you get excited about this. I'm excited about it. I think we can do lots of great stuff, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to working any, with anybody who wants to get involved and make a commitment. Thank you.